Well, how do we do this? And this is where we're going to conclude this morning. I'm going to take you on a quick journey. How do we translate this book into holy living? Well, we bow before the author. We call him our divine teacher. And we yield to his divine witness. We meet him sitting on the witness stand, telling us what we don't know about a situation, and we bow before him. The word testimony is always and only used of the Lord. It's always speaking of the reality of him as almighty God being the best witness to every event. Now let me show you a few events. Turn back to Genesis 1. And we'll start in Genesis and we're going to go forward to Revelation. And I want to show you God being the perfect witness. I have a friend, he's an expert witness. And they call him in and they pay him $250 an hour. And he speaks as an expert witness on this thing. Can you imagine just wearing a suit and flying somewhere and getting $250 an hour to sit on the witness stand and be an expert witness? I can't, but I'll tell you what, God for free will sit as the expert witness. Number one on creation, the beginning. Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 1, it says, in the beginning, God. And here's the witness stepping forth. Here's the divine witness taking the stand. Here he he comes before us and he says, no theories, no mysteries. I was there. I'll tell you what happened to creation. Listen to me as I speak as an eyewitness. Okay, what does he tell us? Well, from the dawn of the universe. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form. It was void. Darkness was over the face of the deep. The Spirit of God hovered or moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And instantly, by divine creative power, light began. You say, wow, wasn't there any light before that one? The divine witness says that the light that we know in the universe, he began it all when he spoke. I mean, I don't, I don't have to speculate. Now, is this just in one part of the universe? Was he over here? I mean, he's the only one there. Why would my little, warped, twisted, fallen human mind question the only person that witnessed that event? I mean, he said it happened. And before time began, and before matter existed, and before the forces that bind our cosmos together were instituted by the Creator, God speaks, and they come into existence. Well, uh, he also said this in the book of Job, and now turn to the middle of your Bible, Job. And this is uh, Job confronting his Creator in chapter 38. And he says this in Job 38 in verse 4. Right in the middle, just four psalms. Where were you, God says to Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Were you around, Job? Of course, we'd all have to answer no with Job. You know, from the foundation of the earth, I can see God talking about from the dawn of the universe because I like stars and galaxies and all that stuff out there. But, you know, until I really spent time this week looking at the foundation of the earth, I never thought it was a big deal. It doesn't sound like much until you penetrate the thin skin of the earth and as I said earlier, proportionately, it's the size of the shell of an egg to the egg. And the, the shell is the crust, but the core of the earth, the foundations, is the big part of the earth. Beneath the crust of our earth, which is only 30 miles thick in some places, 90 miles thick in others, is what we call the mantle. And it's made up of a rigid lithosphere, a lithos stone, a stone sphere. It's kind of uh, got one component that, that's called an asthenosphere, which means it's a a semi-solid kind of elastic plastic. That's where our earthquakes ripple through there. Below that is a solid mesosphere. And then the foundations are the core and the outer core. The outer core is liquid nickel and iron, liquid metal, densely compressed, superheated. The inner core is solid because it's so compressed. And it's 6,000 degrees centigrade. That's hotter than the surface of the sun temperature. You know, when they were mapping and doing their studies on the Earth, oceanographers in the 60s were were trying to figure out what they could figure out about the core of the Earth from the surface, and they started mapping the oceans. And it took them about 18 years to map the floor of the oceans. That's when they found all the canyons and the trenches and all that. But you know what they found is is interesting? There is a 46,000-mile mountain range that completely encircles our planet and goes through all seven of the seas. It's an unbroken mountain range that just runs through the waters of this planet 
of which a majority of this planet of the surface is water. And what God said is, he says, do you know about when I laid the foundations of the earth, when I caused the mountains to rise up? I mean, they didn't even know until the 60s about this mountain range. It, it crops up in places, the Hawaiian Islands, the Azores, and other places. But God says, do you know how I did all that? Do you know how I put in the 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 forces that, that put this planet together, that cause the heat to radiate out, that cause all the seismic activity? Look at Isaiah for another one. Uh, Isaiah, it goes Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Isaiah, chapter 40. I'm going to start reading in verse 12. Because God says, from the dawn of the universe, I'm the only witness. I was the only one that was down at the foundations of the earth when I put it together, when I raised the mountains up from the deep. He says, I'm the only one that was there. He says, I'm also the only one that can speak to you from the throne of the Almighty Creator, which is beyond all that we can comprehend. And here he's speaking in Isaiah 40. And this is a great chapter. If you're ever a little discouraged about what's going on in your world, and if it's cracking and falling in, and if, if there are earthquakes in your world, sometime turn to Isaiah 40. We all know verse 31, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength and will mount up with wings like eagles. And we like to comfort ourselves with that verse, but it's not as comforting as it could be unless you start in verse 12. Let me show you verse 12. Who measured the waters in the hollow of his hands? Who marked off the heavens by a span? Now, the universe, our whole universe, God, what he's saying here graphically is he says, I just go like that. And he says, I measure the universe. That means that God is so much greater than our universe. And the entire cosmos as we know it, this seemingly infinite, expanding universe, God goes, hmm, it's about that long. Kind of like you check your squash in the garden, see how they're growing. Oh, it's growing a little bit. God, see, he says, I'm sitting on my throne. He says, I'm I'm." Bigger, I'm beyond, I'm more than all of your world and all the storms within it. He says, who's calculated, continuing verse 12, the dust of the earth by measure and weighed the mountains in a balance, the hills on a pair of scales? And we didn't even know about that 46,000 mile long mountain range. God says, I've already weighed them. I put them there. I know all about them. Who's directed, verse 13, the Spirit of the Lord. Verse 15, behold the nations. They're a drop in the bucket. You ever heard that expression? Oh, it's just a drop in the bucket. Who thought of that expression? God. He says all the people, all the civilizations, all the armaments, all the terrorists, and all the armies, he said, are just a drop in the bucket. He said they're nothing. They're regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. Verse 18, to whom will you liken God? What likeness will you compare with him? Verse 19, are you going to be involved in the folly of idolatry? Are you going to try and reduce the infinite God to an image? Verse 21, don't you know? Have you not heard? Has not it been declared to you from the beginning? Haven't you understood from the foundations of the earth? We just talked about that. The asthenosphere and the mesosphere and the inner core and the, the, the outer core. Hasn't it been declared to you from the beginning? Verse 22, that he who sits above the circle of the earth. Isaiah was written 600 B.C., and Isaiah knew more than scientists knew until the 16th century A.D. Isaiah knew that the earth was a circle, a sphere. And it says right here, God says, he doesn't say like the Persian mystery gods and like a lot of the other gobbledygook of false religions that the earth is flat and all this stuff. He says, I sit on my throne above the vault, the circle of the earth. And the inhabitants of the earth, verse 22 says, are like grasshoppers. God says, I am the one who stretch out the heavens like a curtain. I spread them out like a tent to dwell in. The whole universe to God is like spreading out a tent. I mean, it's just, it's really kind of easy for him. He's beyond all that. Verse 25, to whom will you liken me, that I should be as equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high. See who has created the stars. He didn't just create them. The one who leads forth their host by number. He doesn't just number them. He calls them all by name. Next time you think you have too many problems. Next time you think that there is just too much going on in your world. That it's just too heavy. That nobody knows. That you have tried and you're about ready to give up. Think about the one who wants to be the divine witness to you to how to live your life and how to live my life, that says, I made the stars, I've numbered them all, 
and they're not, I'm not impersonally related to them. Uh, you know how often you call and they say, the first thing you say, you're going to try and order something on the phone. Could you look at the label on the front of your magazine and give us your number, please? They don't care your name. Could you give us your number, please? You know, we're just so impersonalized in our society. And you know what God says? I created the stars. I numbered them, but I'm not impersonal. I gave them all a name. And God says, if I named those solar furnaces and if I've numbered the hairs on your head, how much more concern do you think I have for you? Continuing to read. Because, verse 26, because of the greatness of his power and the strength of his might, not one star is missing. He doesn't, he doesn't, you know, when God's in charge of things, a lot better than when we are. I was just sharing in Bible story time with our children that when God ran the Israeli army, they didn't have any casualties. They wiped out all the twelve nations, or the seven nations of the Canaanites. They wiped out every one of them. They didn't lose a single soldier. They had not only no deaths, they had no injuries. When God runs the army, the first time they ran it, they got wiped out. And they ran home, scared to death. Little lesson here. God says, I'm the divine witness. I'll tell you how to live life. I'll tell you how to know the end from the beginning. I will tell you how to, to find out, and we'll see next time, how to live your life in marriage, how to raise your family. God says, great, you got Spock to tell you what the little spots are on your children's neck. How would you like to know about the spots on their soul? I'll tell you how to deal with those because I'm the one that created the family. I'm the one that gives you the authority to be a godly parent. You want to know how to have a, a marriage that God says is supposed to be like intoxicatingly wonderful? You don't have to go to a uh, weekend retreat with Dennis Rainey, although it's okay to do that. God says, I will give you a daily instruction in marriage. What happens if we don't listen? And I want to close with this. This was painted on the wall of a cathedral in medieval Europe in Lübeck, Germany. And you probably heard it before, but you didn't know where it came from. And some monk studying the scriptures, probably in the same generation as Martin Luther from the age of the cathedral, finally came to grips with the scriptures as the divine witness of God. And I believe it changed his life. And he painted this on the cathedral wall. You call me master and obey me not. You call me light and yet you see me not. You call me the way, but you walk me not. You call me the life, but you live me not. You call me wise, you follow me not. You call me fair, and yet you live me not. You call me rich, you ask me not. You call me eternal, you seek me not. If I condemn thee, blame me not. What happens when you don't listen to the divine witness? Then the scriptures say in Revelation 20 and verse 15, that all who will not listen to that witness and who will not in faith bow to the simple message of salvation who will not humble themselves, contritely confess that they are lost and a sinner and that he alone, Jesus Christ, is the only payment for their sin. For those who will not submit to him as Lord and yield to him as Savior, forgiver, giver of eternal life, it says that they will someday stand all alone before his throne. And he will cast them or have them cast by a mighty angel into the lake of fire that burneth with fire and brimstone eternally. If I condemn thee, blame me not. Why? Because he says, I'm the divine witness. I've revealed myself to you.